Good afternoon. ITEC India welcomes the speaker Dr. Mamta Manglani, participants and guests to the HIV AIDS National Distance Learning Seminar Series. Today's topic is PPTCT, Current National Guidelines. Before the session, let us know briefly about today's speaker Dr. Mamta Vijay Manglani, who is currently a professor and head Department of Pediatrics, Chief Division of Hematology Oncology. Program Director of Pediatric Center of Excellence for HIV Care at Lokmanya Tilak Municipal Medical College and General Hospital, Zion, Mumbai. She was a co -in Chief Investigator, Co-Investigator, Project Coordinator for numerous research projects conducted and ongoing. She was a Project Coordinator for AIDS International Training and Research Project, AITRP, in collaboration with New York University Medical Center USA which was completed in 2006 and she stands as chief investigator for numerous international research collaborations. She delivered five orations, 126 publications and 380 presentations including papers and guest lectures. I request Dr. Mamta Manglani to kindly take over the session. Thank you, Bala, for your kind introduction. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me and uh, I'll begin my talk. As you all know, first of all, let me wish all of you a very, very good afternoon because I'm seeing all the messages which are coming, everybody wishing me good afternoon. So I wish you back good afternoon and welcome you to this session. Uh, as we all know, PPTCT has really now transformed our pediatric HIV future. And therefore, it is important for us to know what our country has done related to the uh, prevention of parent-to-child transmission of HIV infection. Uh, we have moved really fast as far as improving upon the guidelines for our HIV-infected mothers is concerned. And hence, I thought it was appropriate that we discuss today the current national guidelines. As you may be aware, The epidemic which is now actually waning, I would say it has really plateaued in the world, still continues to have many, many millions of people living with it. So HIV affects 35 million people totally, of which children below uh, 15 years are, I'll just point out so that you can see this. Pointer here. Okay, I'm not able to get the pointer here. So, uh, as you can see here, children below 15 years are 3.2 million all over the world. And if you see newly infected children, it is about 240,000 uh, children who were infected newly in 2013. I can't get the pointer somehow. Ah, yeah. And then if you see the number of deaths that happened in children below 15 years in the last in the year 2013, it is 190,000, which is quite a huge figure. If we were to curtail children getting infected, we would curtail the infant mortality as well as under 5 mortality in a big way. Hence, PPTCT forms an important aspect not just of HIV epidemic but also of the um, mortality in children. I've already spoken of these figures, so we go to the next slide now. Now here I want to just point out a couple of things. If you look at the comparison of the American and the Asian figures as of 2013, the adults and children living with HIV, we have 2.3 million in America and Western and Central Europe, whereas we have 4.8 million in Asia and Pacific uh, region. But if you look at the number of people living by, with HIV by country, you can see 6% of the population with HIV lives in India, which is quite a big number. Only 4% are in USA. And if you see all the other countries, the percentage is pretty low. Whereas we, are, we form a large part of the epidemic, besides South Africa, which has a higher number. Of course, we have uh, really something to be proud of that we have so many ART centers now and slowly but surely 
uh, NACO has been able to increase the number of ART centers over the years and today we have about 450 centers countrywide and the number of children that are now covered adds up to 44,592. So this is something really interesting. We have been able to give good care to our children who are already born with HIV. But it would be wonderful to not have children being born with HIV. Most of the children are infected through from mothers rather from parent because generally in our country it's a heterosexual route of transmission which was common earlier and we were finding the men infecting women and women in turn infecting their babies and 96 percent of the children out of uh, 1621 1563 children in our own center are confirmed perinatal transmission making it a very huge number through mother to child. This is where we can curtail the epidemic completely uh, by preventing this transmission. Any mother when she has a baby or any parent when they have their for a baby, they naturally would wish that their baby is absolutely fine, hale and hearty and not infected with any of the infections, especially HIV. Why are we so concerned about HIV infection in children? We have ART drugs, we could treat them, we could take care of the infection very well. Today we know that with ART drugs, ch children can live for 30 years, 40 years down the line as we have seen in the western world. However, we are not happy just to have ART drugs and treat them. We want to prevent them from getting HIV for various reasons. And that re one of the reasons as I will show you in this graph is that the cumulative probability of death in a child is very high if he is infected. Over three years of life, this child has a 50 to 60 percent chance of dying in case he does not receive his ART drugs or has some opportunistic infections which are not curtailed. If you see in children who are not infected, the mortality is much lower, even less than 5% in the first three years of life. And this big difference is what we want to bridge by not allowing children to get infected from mothers. Now, we all are aware that if we have 100 pregnant HIV infected women on an average 30 babies would be infected. Now when are they infected? 5 become infected during pregnancy, 15 at the time of delivery and 10 infected through breastfeeding mostly in the early weeks of breastfeeding. This is the scenario how the baby gets infected. But the basic focus would be on these 15 who become infected at the time of delivery has been on this 15% uh, in the past and that is how our previous PPTCT national program focused on the intranatal, uh, intrapartum transmission or intranatal transmission. But antenatal and postnatal transmissions were really not being taken care of as well as they should be. But we have better guidelines now. I will be coming to it shortly. Before that, I would just like to remind all of us that the Millennium Development Goals which were to be achieved by 2015 are going to be now achieved maybe in the next two or three years in our country. What was the goal? There were two goals. One, that you reduce the number of infect new infections among children by 90% by which you reduce AIDS related infant deaths by more than 50%. And this was possible by providing antiretroviral therapy to all HIV infected children who did not benefit from the preventive uh, therapy or preventive medication. Also reduce the number of AIDS related maternal deaths by 50%. These are the goals of MDG by 2015. We are already in 2015. So hopefully in the next one or two years we will reach these targets. What can we do to achieve these goals? As you can see here, PPTCT has four prong strategy. Prong one, which is the primary prevention of the HIV amongst adult women who are in the reproductive age group. Prong two is preventing unintended pregnancies. That means if they didn't desire to have a baby, we should give them all possible family planning measures such that they do not have a pregnancy which needs to be aborted or was unwanted. Prong three is prevention of 
mother to child transmission which we'll be talking in a greater detail and prong 4 as you know is the care support and treatment in a mother who's infected as well as her child if the child happens to get infected so if you look at the prong 1 i think we have done uh, quite a quite well uh, the goal is to reduce it to less than more than 50% or rather less than 50% sorry so by 50% Prong 2, we have to achieve zero unmet need for family planning. Now, if we look at the change in the incidence of HIV infection from 2001 to 2009, you can see India has done well by decreasing the incidence by more than 25%, which is a good sign and therefore the prong 1 has been achieved to a great extent. Similarly, if you look at the prevalence which has been among the antenatal mothers who have been tested, the percentage positivity has come down to 0.11% in the year 2013. And this therefore makes us proud that we have been able to achieve the first prong relatively successfully. Now, if we look at the countdown to zero that has been the target by the MDG goals, have we really been able to do something for that? Interestingly, an 11-year-old Nigerian who was born free of HIV spoke to world leaders who gathered in New York in 2010 to share the progress made towards achieving the Millennium Development Goals by 2015. And he said a very interesting statement, as you can see here, no child should be born with HIV. No child should be an orphan because of HIV. No child should die due to lack of access to treatment. This is what is interesting that a child understands that these things should happen and therefore all of us better understand and do things in that direction. What has happened to the number of children newly infected with HIV in low and middle income countries? Between 2000 and 2015 there has been a steady decline and in fact if you see the decline has been very good up till 2012 but what we have to reach is, I am sorry. What we have to reach is finally almost zero newly infected children by 2015 and we are already in 2015. Hopefully, we will bridge this gap in the next two years. Now, let us look at outcomes in uh, women who are HIV infected. What would happen? As I earlier told you that it is about 30 percent of infants who would be infected. As mentioned here, 25 to 45 infants would be HIV infected and intrapartum ARV prophylaxis was already being offered to prevent this aspect where 15 percent would be infected. But what about transmission in the antenatal and postnatal period? This was not being covered by the previous PPTCT program. Of course, this was the outcome. We had children who got infected despite nevirapine prophylaxis and this is one of our babies who was born in September 2010 and was infected and similarly another baby in 2010 uh, infected but doing well because of ART being given to them. As we all are aware, <coughs> without any uh, intervention, if a mother is infected, there is a 30 to 45 percent chance that if the baby is breastfed, then the baby would get infected. With no ARV and no breastfeeding, we would have a 20 to 25 percent chance. If we gave short course with one ARV, we would have a 15 to 25 percent chance. And this is what we had been doing with nevirapine prophylaxis. If we look at three ARVs with no breastfeeding, which is what the Western world is doing, there would be a very, very low chance, that is one percent chance that the baby would get infected. We might not be able to emulate that because if we do not breastfeed, there is a hazard of many, many other problems which may add to the infant mortality in a big way such as diarrheal diseases, pneumonias, etc., malnutrition, etc. Three ARVs with breastfeeding. This is where we can probably target a 2 to 5 percent transmission risk which is again a very, very successful way of preventing transmission to the baby. So maybe this is what would be feasible in our setting and this is what the national program has finally agreed upon and we have implemented since last almost more than a year. 
so looking at again the third prong preventing mother to child transmission we would aim at 5% or less transmission to the baby and this is what the national program probably aims at you give art to all pregnant women life long not only to treat the hiv infected pregnant women for her own health but also for ppdct how does art work for ppdct it helps to reduce the maternal viral load it loads the fetus with these arvs that prevent the transmitted variants if any from replicating now arv prophylaxis should not stop at giving to the mother during pregnancy or postnatally but also we need to use short term nevirapine syrup in infants up to the age of 6 weeks minimum longer if the mother has received less than 24 weeks of uh, arv now pregnant and breastfeeding women who are not already receiving art should be started on the uh, triple drug arv tenofovir lamivudin efavirenz and this should be given lifelong once started this is not like what we were doing with single dose nevirapine just giving at the time of delivery to the mother and baby and forgetting about it here the mother starts on tenofovir lamivudin efavirenz in pregnancy and continues it throughout her life not just for the baby to be prevented from getting infected but also for her own health sake and for her own virus being suppressed and there is no indication for abortion termination of pregnancy in women exposed even to efavirenz in the first trimester of pregnancy as recent studies have not shown any increase incidence of neural tube defects in the newborns now if there was a pregnant woman having prior exposure to nnrti for ppt ct such as single dose nevirapine which we have been giving regularly and now she has come with a second pregnancy to us then because of the risk of resistance that is archived to the nnrti drugs in this population efavirenz will not be effective in this regimen and thus this the set of women will get uh, should get tenofovir lamivudin and ritonavir boosted lopinavir so the dose will be tenofovir and lamivudin 300 mg each one tablet once only whereas fixed dose of lopinavir ritonavir 250 respectively would be two tablets twice a day so this would be a twice a day regimen for the lopinavir ritonavir whereas in the previous uh, slide as i showed you it's a once a day one pill so it is very convenient and easy to remember dosing now let's look at what you would give to the infant when the mother is receiving triple regimen tenofovir lamivudin and efavirenz or tenofovir lamivudin and lopinavir ritonavir if the mother is receiving tenofovir efavirenz based regimen uh, or even uh, lopinavir based regimen the infants would receive nevirapine which would be for 6 weeks if the mother has received uh, more than 4 weeks actually according to our national guidelines 24 weeks is the cut off i'm not sure whether it should be 4 weeks but it is 24 weeks so if mother has received less than 24 weeks of uh, the triple arv then the baby would receive for 12 weeks otherwise the baby would receive for 6 weeks regardless of exclusive breastfeeding or exclusive replacement feeding and the doses are as given here for a baby who's weighing less than 2 kilos you give 2 mg per kg once daily and to babies who are 2 to 2.5 kilos you give 10 mg once daily and above 2 2.5 kilos you give 15 mg once daily so this is a very simple dosing again once daily dosing and therefore easy to remember easy to administer now if a woman has hiv 2 infection and she is not uh, really going to be benefiting from the nnrti drugs because they are not effective against uh, hiv2 then one needs to look at whether she has combined hiv1 or exclusive hiv1 and 2 or exclusive hiv2 infection before considering the ppdct treatment interventions because for these women you cannot use nevirapine efavirenz you will have to give lopinavir ritonavir based therapy and maternal in intervention after baby is born 
after maternal intervention we also need to give to the infant 6 weeks of daily AZT here because you can't use nevirapin here as mentioned earlier that they are not effective against HIV 2. So this would be the change that in the mother it would be lopinavir, ritonavir based regimen and in the infant it would be AZT for 6 weeks minimum. So start syrup AZT in place of nevirapin immediately after birth till 6 weeks of age. The dose being for those who are more than 2.5 kgs 15 milligrams per dose twice daily whereas those who are below 2.5 kg 10 milligrams per dose twice daily. Besides just giving the ARV what other care one must take during delivery and after birth to prevent HIV infection because we should not get complacent that the mother is receiving ARV the baby is going to receive nevirapin or AZT and now we can relax. We cannot do that because we may prevent by reducing the viral load we may also uh, try and reduce the transmission by giving these ARVs through other methods of uh, not allowing the virions to replicate in the baby. But we might end up causing contamination and leaving the baby to get infected with HIV in the bargain and negating all the effect of ARV that we were giving to the mother. So we have to take care of certain things. For example, in all the high risk delivery techniques should be avoided. Artificial rupture of membranes when labor is not progressing should be avoided. Prolonged rupture of membranes should be avoided. Episiotomy should be avoided. Invasive fetal monitoring or del delivery techniques should be avoided. Mixing of maternal and fetal body fluids should be avoided at every cost. Therefore, anything that is going to cause any of those which I mentioned earlier should be avoided. So what do you do? You do just one PV exam, do not repeat PV exams, monitor contractions and fetal heart sounds, give ART ARV prophylaxis to mother as prescribed, clean vagina with 0.25% chlorhexidine, this has been shown to uh, be effective in reducing the transmission, apply pressure at perineum when it is bulging to prevent episiotomy. The don'ts that you must do is, don't isolate the woman, let her be part of the delivering area. Don't shave pubic area, don't give an enema, don't perform frequent PV exams, don't rupture membranes unless indicated and don't use instrumental deliveries unless absolutely necessary. So if we follow these type of care during delivery, we would be able to reduce the transmission even further and not just rely on ARVs but also help further in reducing. What else we must do? We must of course use personal protection to reduce chances of us getting in infected also while drawing blood samples, while giving injections, while conducting delivery, while wiping the newly born baby, while cleaning the umbilical cord, while assisting mother to express breastfeeds, we should take care that we use personal protection or universal precautions. Reduce splash of blood and fluids by using clamps and gauze, avoid milking of umbilical cord. So call use linen in bleach solution for 2 hours. Dispose waste based on protocols correctly as biohazardous if they are contaminated with blood of blood, body fluids. What is the immediate newborn care that one must exercise? Maintain universal precautions throughout. Do not try to be heroic by doing suction with mouth in the baby also. Wipe baby's mouth and nostrils with gauze when the head is delivered. Clamp cord immediately after birth. Delayed clam clamping of the cord can allow transmission of HIV. Instead of 30 seconds, we may clamp by in 15 seconds in HIV infected mothers. Avoid milking the cord. Cover the cord with gloved hand or gauze before cutting. Wipe the baby dry with a towel. Use suction only when meconium stained lycor is present and even there when you are using suction, Use the mucus catheter suction with the teeth and not with mouth. Can feeding help us further in reducing transmission? We are all aware about the risk of breastfeeding and HIV transmission. However, in context of present guide, national guidelines, one must remember that since you are covering the baby by maternal ARV throughout breastfeeding and you are covering the baby herself himself, 
during the first 6 weeks of life when the baby is breastfeeding breast milk related transmission is going to be very negligible and hence it may be still worthwhile considering exclusive breastfeeding as the choice of feeding in every baby who is HIV born to HIV infected mothers. Now let's look at the literature related to feeding. What is the risk of transmission of HIV 1 through feeding? Now very clearly you can see in this landmark study by Kautsodis in Lancet 2002, 31.6% babies were infected when the babies were breastfed. This is a cumulative transmission and not just through breastfeeding. But if they were never breastfed, the transmission was much lower cumulatively, suggesting that breastfeeding does cause significant transmission. But if you look at mixed feeding, it was higher than even breastfeeding. And that makes it important because you should never advocate mixed feeding because you cause micro abrasions through the cow's milk or uh, foreign protein. And this leads to allowing the virus to get through the uh, into the system, into the blood, uh, it breaches the barrier of mucosa and causes invasion of the blood by the virus and leads to tra transmission of HIV. So never uh, mixed feed is what message I want to give here. But don't get confused between these two also because what I want to bring out here is while it is quite high uh, risk of transmission of HIV when you breastfeed a baby, this was when no ARV prophylaxis was given. No intervention was done in the form of covering the baby with some antiretroviral medications. And therefore, this should not be taken as the standard, gold standard for us at present. What are the national guidelines on feeding HIV exposed and infected babies below 6 months? As we all know, exclusive breastfeeding for at least 6 months Continue breastfeeding till 12 months where possible in HIV exposed babies is what is recommended. Only in situations where breastfeeding cannot be done or individual mother's choice, then replacement feeding may be considered if all six criteria for replacement feeding are fulfilled. What are these six criteria? I am going to come to it in a minute. What are the uh, situations? I have said in situations where breastfeeding cannot be done. Some people imagine that there could be many situations where breastfeeding cannot be done, mother is not able to sit up, mother is not uh, still, you know, she's drowsy intermittently, she's just had a cesarean section. These are hardly reasons for not breastfeeding because you can support the mother, the family can support, the caregiver can support the mother for these issues and make her breastfeed. The only reasons where breastfeeding may not be possible is of course, maternal death, there is no question or severe maternal sickness. These are two uh, conditions which are absolutely unconditionally the right situations where breastfeeding can be, cannot be done. When we say individual mother's choice as a reason for not breastfeeding, uh, here you have to remember that there are six criteria which we must evaluate for the mother and decide whether the mother can give replacement feeding. And these six criteria are mentioned in this slide. Safe water and sanitation. This should be assured not only at the household but in the community. Then they should be able to reliably afford to provide sufficient replacement feeding to support normal growth and development of the infant. Mother or caregiver should be able to prepare it frequently enough in a clean manner so as to prevent diarrheal diseases and malnutrition. The mother or caregiver should be able to give exclusive replacement feeding in the first six months. Family should be supportive of the practice. And the most of, important of all, I would say, is that mother or caregiver should be able to access health care that offers comprehensive child health services. Why is this very important? I will really bring out this through an example <coughs> in the next slide. Uh, I think it's a slide after this. But let me just go through these uh, feeding practices as per NACO recommendations. It's the same as I've already told you. If a baby is infected, then you can continue breastfeeding even up to 24 months. But if the baby is negative, HIV uninfected till uh, 6 months, you continue exclusive feeding. 
then you can start complementary feeding and then continue only till 12 months do not give beyond 12 months she should gradually stop uh, based on her comfort level now this is when you have a result of the early infant diagnosis without early infant diagnosis you cannot determine whether the baby is infected or not infected so once we have the dna pcr results and we know two positives uh, in a child in a baby confirming the hiv positive status then you may continue breastfeeding as long as 24 months and two dna pcrs which are negative confirming hiv negative status of the child here we should not continue beyond 12 months because we do not want a chance that breast milk may transmit the virus to this baby of course one must remember when a baby is being breastfed it is a continual exposure of hiv in the baby and therefore we need to test once again with dna pcr 6 weeks after cessation of breastfeeding according to the eid protocol up to 18 months of age so this is important to remember that one needs to test again when the baby has been stopped on breastfeeding and 6 weeks later now this is the example i was talking of this is one of the uh, babies who came to us at 5 months of age excuse me a minute this baby came to our hospital with a history of diarrhea and not taking feeds properly not passing urine adequately was severely dehydrated and in sepsis this baby was bottle fed and given formula feed because the parents were hiv infected and they did not understand the implications of not breastfeeding but they were concerned about keeping the baby hiv uninfected to our surprise this baby of course remained uninfected <clears throat> but was so severely malnourished required a month to get to this state but fortunately because he could access care in a tertiary level hospital like ours we could salvage this child and make him a healthy infant and now he is a 5 year old boy who is doing very well and is uninfected however the moral of the story is suppose this baby at this stage had not received a tertiary level care had not been able to access tertiary level health care we would have lost this child to malnutrition and diarrheal diseases severe dehydration what i want to bring the point here is that on one hand we want to save children from dying from hiv on the other hand we would kill them from diarrhea hence it is important to understand we do not want a child surviving h of a, rather you know being prevented from getting hiv but dying of something else we want a child who survives irrespective of hiv and also is treated for hiv well in case he becomes hiv infected that should be our goal and not just preventing hiv so as we already mentioned about the first three prongs now the fourth prong is receiving care by the mother and the child who is infected this is an important aspect because if you care for this mother well at least in a second pregnancy or third pregnancy she would naturally be better suppressed virally so as to not transmit it to her next child and if she receives care she'll be able to care for her child who is infected or not infected and therefore the mortality would be lowered looking at continuum of care which is important to look at the last prong of ppdct we have to have good antenatal ppdct services where we must uh, impress upon everybody to see that all women who are hiv infected are initiated on art as we said earlier now at present we do not look at cd4 counts we do not look at uh, clinical staging irrespective of that any infected woman who is pregnant should be initiated on art intranatally of course she should be continued on art postnatally she should be again continued on art so the mother is taken care of counseling services should be done in all phases testing should be done in all phases and institutional delivery should be encouraged of course link with art services and cd4 testing at every stage again and here once the baby is born 
early infant diagnosis and pediatric ART initiation is also equally important. So this would give really a good care to the baby and the mother. The last part, this postnatal PPTCT services and linking with uh, EID and pediatric ART initiation would take care of the baby even if the baby finally gets infected. So I think I'm coming to the close of my talk. The take home messages from this particular uh, session is that option B plus which we are using today in the country that is initiating all HIV infected pregnant women on ART is a real good option for a country like ours where we might have issues of uh, the counselors, the medical officers having a great turnover in ART centers and therefore confusion occurring if we had various options. So it is a single option where all women have to be started if they are infected on a triple drug ARV. The drugs that we use are tenofovir, lamivudin, efavirenz in all women who are not exposed to an NRTI previously. If they are exposed, they should be on lopinavir, ritonavir based regimen. Best obstetric and appropriate infant feeding practices are in effective interventions to reduce parent to child transmission. Effective implementation of the continuum which I just showed you in the last slide where even postnatally they should be linked to the EID services and the pediatric ART services and taken care of both mother and baby should be taken care of. This would really help us and such effective PPTCT uh, program would definitely wipe out pediatric HIV in the future. In fact, I always um, make a statement to everybody that I would love that the pediatric centers of excellence close down in the next 5 to 10 years with no pediatric patient coming with HIV to us. I think this would be the final message. I thank you all for a patient hearing. I'm sure there would be some questions and we have some time. So maybe we can answer those. So what to do if patient is not tolerating effervorants? Uh, yeah, you can consider option of lopinavir, ritonavir after con considering all possible methods of uh, helping him with tolerating. So, I, I would say that. With low CD4 count, can we advise breastfeeding? Of course, you can advise breastfeeding. If the mother is uh, well, she can continue. And as far as what I would think, if ARV is given to the mother, her CD4 counts would go on improving slowly but steadily. What about the 18 months testing for the baby if mother is still breastfeeding? Yeah, you have to continue uh, the uh, 18 month testing for the baby. But mother should not be breastfeeding unless if baby is inf not infected. Information regarding management of both HIV-1 and HIV-2. If both are uh, positive, then you have to still give them lopinavir, ritonavir based regimen because for 2, nevirapine effavirenz will not work. The hard copy of presentation will be available to you probably through iTech. So I would request them to do the needful. If a lady on ZLN gets pregnant, regimen should we say continue same or change? Uh, well, tenofovir is a more efficacious regimen, but you could continue ZLN too. If she is already on ZLN, ZLN you could make it ZLE at least. Because nevirapin we would not prefer. Patient ANC with COX should we start AKT and ART same day? Obviously not. We can always take two weeks time to start ART. We can first treat her for tuberculosis and then add on the ART. It's not an urgent urgency even in pregnancy. Explain again brief about breastfeeding in PLHIV mother. Uh, as I said, all mothers who are able to breastfeed should be breastfeeding. And very, very rarely we would come across in our country, especially in a public hospital setup that mother can't breastfeed. So you should encourage breastfeeding in a mother who is HIV infected and with ARV ongoing it would not be really difficult to imagine that there will be no transmission with breastfeeding. If the mother comes after 3 or 4 months after delivery, 
whether to give nevirapine along with CPT. No, the 3 or 4 months is too long a time, there will be no impact of nevirapine. Um, maybe up to few days after delivery you may still give. Maybe weeks also is alright but not months. In eclampsia, this I really would not be able to answer you. you I have not come across any uh, such query from my own uh, gynec department. So, I really don't know in eclampsia whether TLE is safe. I suppose it should be safe. Is it necessary to change? Yes, it would be necessary because if the mother CD4 is high, nevirapin will cause significant hepatitis. There is a higher chance of hepatitis, hepatotoxicity rather. Yeah, as I said, I will definitely like to uh, send you a hard copy of this presentation. What is EPTCT program? Uh, I am not aware. Extend it? What? Means what? What is the difference? No, I am not aware. EPTCT, I am not aware. Okay, so, mother on ART, LFU, again uh, re reached within 6 months pregnancy regimen should be changed. No, on which regimen? If she is LFU means she is not taken intermittently? I am not sure what your question is. If any of you know what is EPTCT, please let us know. I would also like to know. Gravida 1, TLE, second Gravida, which regimen? TLE. She is not going to stop anyway the regimen. She is going to continue. Gravida 1, once put on TLE, she is going to take lifelong. So, you don't have to change unless you document that she is failing that regimen. You are reading the questions, no? Hmm. Otherwise, you will not know the context in which. Elimination of parent to child transmission can be done if we are able to do uh, absolute no breastfeeding with uh, ARV prophylaxis which is effective and good like TLE. So, but we are not going to recommend no breastfeeding because our mortality will be higher um, if we do not breastfeed. Can you please explain ma'am about how high CD4 interferes with nevirapine hepatotoxicity? Uh, it's a uh, observation that those who have high CD4, they develop a higher chance, they have a higher chance of developing nevirapine related hepatotoxicity during pregnancy. This is specific for pregnancy. LFU mother on ZLN previously tracked at 6 months of pregnancy, whether we should give ZLN or change the regimen. I mean it is a very difficult question to answer because first of all we are not recommending ZLN as a regimen, we are recommending TLE. Uh, whether I would uh, continue ZLN, no because if 6 months she has not taken anything and now she has come, I would still prefer TLE. But I am not sure whether effavirenz will also work if she has never up in resistance. See antibody testing at 18 months if it is negative in the baby you would in fact encourage the mother to stop breastfeeding. If it is positive we do not know whether the baby is infected or it is maternal antibody still lingering. More likely it would be her baby's antibodies at 18 months onwards you are talking of. So yeah if the baby is infected breastfeeding can be continued but if the baby is non-infected then you would consider stopping breastfeeding and then again after 6 weeks 
uh, performing a test. In this case, if you are doing antibody testing, we would do after 3 months. Okay, you are saying EPTCD is elimination of parent to child transmission. Yeah, but I don't think we are doing that program still. Is it being implemented anywhere if you know? Thanks to all of you who found this interesting. If Gravida won TLE, she is going to be on TLE continuously even when she becomes pregnant second time. So there is no question of changing the regimen unless there is a suspicion of failure of first line. TLE is superior to ZLE as far as efficacy is concerned. PCO is sign is typing. Oh. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ankambe, for your good comments. Thank you, ma'am, for the valuable session yeah. today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I request all the participants to kindly enter the e-poll with a question: Do you think this session was useful in enhancing your clinical knowledge and skills? I once again request all the parts who have not given their poll to kindly enter. As informed, the session, uh, the recorded link of the session and the slides uh, will be circulated regularly. Our next session is on 27th March at 2 p.m. on the topic Airborne Infection Control in HIV TB Settings by Dr. Rajesh Deshmukh on an occasion of T HIV TB Week from NACO. Twenty-seven.
Thank you, ma'am, for the session. Uh, there are no questions. Uh, we'll wind up the session for now.